Hi, and welcome to episode 23 of the Facts and Blog and Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Christopher from C&G Holsters is on with us. He's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, selecting a holster, things you need to consider, kind of the different carrying points, and also what C&G brings to the marketplace. So if you are interested in purchasing a new holster, or maybe you have a friend that's getting uh, into a concealed carry permit for the first time and they need some help, I think this will be a great resource for you. Before we get started, though, I do want to remind you that we are still in our Old Glory event celebrating Independence Day from last weekend, and uh, you could enter to win one of two prize packs. That includes a custom-done Bantam PCC uh, that features a one-off coating, Cerakote, and a laser job, and a few other little upgrades that uh, separate them out from the Bantams, including muzzlock on the pistol length and an integral barrel on the rifle length so you'll want to make sure you check that out you could just go to factsandfirearms.com to enter and we have a lot of great sponsors that are helping us with that including crimson trace ets uh we also have uh wheeler is giving some of their fat wrenches for this condition one uh sb tactical it's a really really fun promotion and uh you know good luck to to getting them uh one of those prize packs again in red white and blue or od green and and uh, it could be yours. Staying with the patriotic firearm motif, if you will, we do want to thank you for being part of our donation for the auction put on by PewTubers Anonymous for the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, hosted on GunBroker, which they hosted that for free. So thank you, GunBroker, for making that happen. Uh, the PCC that we had up for auction went for over $2,000, and that is all going back to support uh, the kids and the medical staff at Cincinnati Children's. So thank you to Zach and the PewTubers team and uh, also Tom at One Off Coding for helping us out with that and the good folks at Gun Broker who hosted the auction. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation with Christopher. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us this week. You know, we've been trying to get, you know, more and more people that are able to kind of speak into some of the everyday questions people have just about gun ownership and, uh, you know, what all goes with it. You know, we've had folks on from, um, you know, Crimson Trace and uh, Lockdown and just, you know, kind of the other stuff like, okay, I got the gun now. What, you know, what else do I need? What else do I need to consider? But before we go all the way into holsters, um, would you mind just giving the folks a little bit of background about you, kind of who you are, what you do, and and how CNG came to be? Sure, sure. I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a big honor. Uh, my name is Chris Burns. Uh, born and raised here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I did engineering for a while, um, electronics engineering, everything from semiconductor manufacturing to printed circuit board design. Uh, after that, uh, decided that uh, I've always wanted to be a police officer. So late 20s, I decided that I was going to go to the academy. And I've always been a shooter. So uh, whenever we went through the academy, uh, you know, I was always within the, the top one or two uh, in the class. So when I got approached to be a, uh, a firearms instructor, it was kind of a natural fit for me. And then uh, throughout my career, I uh, did a lot of different things, uh, did a lot of extensive work in narcotics, uh, undercover work, uh, where I actually started making holsters for myself. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, I was, uh, for, you know, if, if for your listeners that are in law enforcement, I was just another cheap cop. And I decided that I wanted to start making them for me to save some money. And frankly, I didn't like the price point of where the holsters were at for what I wanted them to be able to do, because it, there's a big disparity uh, with holsters in the market where functionality and uh, form and durability and, and a lot of things don't really come together. And sometimes you see it's made up in a marketing sense, not in a quality sense. Sure. 
So uh, I started making them for me. Uh, and then as a firearms instructor, you know, my guys in my department were like, oh, if you're making them, make me one. Uh, and then most firearms instructors in law enforcement, we all regionally know each other because we all hang out and take the same training classes and, and train together and, you know, try to help further each other. And uh, they started saying, hey, make me one. Uh, and then our local police supply store here uh, in Pittsburgh, Morco Supply Company, uh, Lee and I have been friends. You know, I'm a gun guy. I have a, a gun gun problem, buying problem <laughs> like everybody else. Sure. And uh, he made a comment and he said, you realize most of the guys coming in and in here buying uh, guns have your holster already ready for the gun. And, and I laughed and I smiled and I was like, yeah, it's kind of like my gun fun, uh, my hobby, you you know, it helps me, helps keep me get whatever guns I want and not get yeah. out at it. <laughs> for sure. And, uh, and he said, did you ever think about stocking them and making them for us so that we could sell them? Because, you know, you have a local following already. It would be an easy sell. And I said, let me think about it. Uh, I went home and, you know, and I gave it some thought cause I knew, uh, you know, I was going from a profitable hobby to, uh, you know, a, a, a part-time small business. And there's a lot of responsibilities that come along with that. So I sat down, we put together a business plan and I did some pricing and I figured out my costs and uh, we delivered them their first order. Uh, and I mean, you know, now we have roughly about 200 dealers nationwide to kind of fast forward to things. Uh, but, you know, Markles is still our, uh, one of our biggest customers locally. Uh, and, you know, they've, uh, they've actually obviously expanded the line a little bit. And, uh, you know, it kind of brings us to where we are today with CNG. Very good. You know, you're, you're talking about, you know, making them for even stuff that you did in, and have done as a police officer working undercover narcotics and so on. You know, I know every department is different, but what is the standard issue holster that you would be given if you weren't making or providing your own? Would it, would it be a Kydex holster? Would it be just like a leather holster? What, what was for your department? What would they have given you? Well, uh, so uh, I was the guy writing the policy at the time. Uh, so I, I had a specific requirement that I felt the guys needed to have for any kind of undercover work. Uh, a lot of departments, it really, do, it really varies nationwide. Some departments say, hey, here's your duty issue and here is your off-duty issue, which also doubles as your undercover issue. Uh, but most of the time the guys uh, have like a requirement where it needs to be a passive level, level one retention holster, and it needs to cover the trigger guard and that's it. Go get them tiger. Yeah. And when you have, you know, wide, uh, a very large disparity there that you can kind of fit in, you know, it kind of opens up the market to just about anything, which is good in a way, uh, because, you know, everybody needs to tailor their kit to themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also enables a lot of, um, you know, in my opinion, substandard products to kind of get let in and, you know, in law enforcement, it's different, you know, guys, uh, civilians wear guns because they want to protect themselves. And, and I'm not saying this in a, in a bad way at all, but you know, you have guys that have a, a cell phone on their hip and they utilize that cell phone holster way more every day than they utilize a gun holster. Sure. And so, uh, you know, understanding the the comfort, the functionality, the durability and all that it is not as familiar to them as, uh, you know, a guy working undercover law enforcement because, you, you know, we use that every day and that's a tool that we use every day to come home every night with. Yeah, for sure. When, uh, so when you were starting to make your own, were mm -hmm. you starting ultimately with Kydex? Were you working with other materials kind of, you know, where, where did your, you know, testing, if you will, kind of start? I knew, uh, I knew leather was just not a good option. And so we, you know, I went right to Kydex, uh, for twofold. I think that a, a hard shell plastic holster is definitely the best option. And not a lot of people know this, but, um, Sikasui company, the parent company of Kydex is actually based out of Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. So, so I have a very big thing with local. Um, all of our parts are actually sourced locally. Uh, everything down to the hardware, uh, everything comes within the Rust Belt. So it's either in Eastern Ohio or Western Pennsylvania, all of our parts come from. So, and I've done that from day one. 
So we, we went with Kydex uh, right away to answer your question. Yeah. Very good. Um, so what are some of the things if somebody, I mean, we know that through the pandemic and everything like this, there are so many new gun owners uh, in America and, uh, you know, just like us, there's many other companies that are trying to get educational content and things out there to kind of help these people kind of understand mm-hmm. what they're getting into and making sure that they have everything that they need. But say mm-hmm. it's someone who's new to firearms or maybe just someone who's new to to actually, you know, having a concealed carry permit or something, you know, what are some things that, you know, you would uh, give them as advice for maybe not even just the holster, but, you know, kind of what, you know, maybe what gun they're, they're going to choose. Um, what are some of those, you know, things that you would walk a friend through who's, who's new to this? You know, the, I think the biggest thing, the biggest mistake that I see with a lot of the new gun owners, especially the, uh, you know, late 20s to, to mid 30s range is they they try to sink a lot of money into the equipment and not enough money in the training. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, you know, me personally, um, I have a Glock 19. I run uh, I run a polymer 80 as well. You know, same exact thing. You guys, you know, the facts and manufacturers, they're good, solid weapons and they're very reliable. Uh, but I run that. The only thing I change on my gun is the sights and I change the grip to basically grip me back. Mm-hmm. So I rough up the texture a little bit in certain areas so I know I can manage the recoil effectively. But I don't put anything else on it. I just shoot it. Yeah. And I think these guys get kind of caught up in, you know, I want to put a red dot on it and I want to do this and I want to do that. And uh, while I think, you know, a a red dot optic is a good option in certain things, I think far too much I see in the industry people, and this is not going to be a popular opinion. It's just an honest one. I see a lot of people masking poor gun handling mechanics and fundamentals, and they're masking it with a red dot. Sure. And instead of them learning how to effectively shoot the weapon and understand how to manage it, uh, they throw a red dot on it, thinking that that's going to make them a better shooter. When in reality, they're not going to be any better with that dot, but they think they are. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's it also turns into you know, not that there's anything wrong with it per se, but it turns into a bit of a hobby. Like you said, I mean, you like to buy guns and things, but if this is going to be what you use to protect yourself uh, and your family or, or whomever, you know, you, you need to be familiar and comfortable and second nature with the mechanics of it before, before you start, you know, blinging it out, if you will. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. you know, and also too, I think there is a, a, a difference between, okay, maybe this is the gun that I like to take to, you know, competition nights and target shooting nights and whatever. And it has all the junk on it and everything, but this is the one that is actually, you know, what I use for, you know, uh, protection, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, concealed carry. Uh, cause yeah, sometimes I'm, I see, I see folks that have just so much on it and I'm like, how, how are you concealing that? That is impressive. You have some magic, you know, body folds or something <laughs> going on there. That's very impressive. So then when people are getting into, you know, say they, they have their firearm selected when they're getting into the holster, uh, you know, what are some things that they need to be looking for and make a decision with? I mean, there's for somebody who's brand new, I could imagine it's incredibly overwhelming. You know, you got all these prefixes and acronyms for things, IWB and OWB and am I appendix carrying? Am I hip carrying? You know, am I allowed to carry outside of the waistband? How do I conceal it? What are some of the ways that, you know, what are some of the things that you would walk someone through when they're actually picking out a holster? Maybe what do you think are the, uh, maybe the top selling ones or maybe the most comfortable for, uh, you know, a beginner, uh, for carrying the, I, this goes as a firearms instructor. So I'm back to that. Uh, I think the, I see people doing with, uh, with new gun owners is, I think a holster really needs three things. It needs functionality, durability, and comfort in that order. So when you start putting comfort above everything, then all of a sudden you start sacrificing uh, functionality, you start sacrificing durability, and you know, oh, it feels comfortable on me. I don't even feel I have it. Okay, that's great, but can you deploy it very quickly? Right. Because 
if your draw, if you can't get to it because you tuck it so deep that you can't get a good purchase on it to get it out of the holster quickly, because you're not, it's not Hollywood. Uh, it's not going to turn around and go from, you're not going to hear the music and the tension is going to start to build. Right. You know, it's going to be, uh Oh, I have to use my gun to defend my life or, or protect my family now. Right. So making sure that you have the right equipment to use that gun that you're training with and you're learning with, I think is just as important. You know, uh, the way I try to equate it to new gun owners is <clears throat> up here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of snow. And uh, if you start to run summer tires and you just grab some donuts on the car and think that you're going to make it through, you know, six inches of snow or a blizzard, you're going to be all over the place and you might as well just not even take the car out. And right. it's the same thing about good equipment with a gun. You know, you can put all the money you want into a gun, but if you don't put a good good quality holster on, uh, you really might as well not even carry it because it's not going to be usable. For sure. So then when we're talking about the holster, you know, let's take a minute to talk mostly about inside the waistband holsters. Um, mm -hmm. The different positions of carry. Uh, for those mm -hmm. who are new, would you just kind of explain like, you know, what's the difference between, you know, a hip carry and an appendix carry and, and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really for me, uh, we only make the holsters for two different positions, the three o'clock and the 12 o'clock, uh, small, of the back carry is nothing that I would promote, nothing that I would encourage. Uh, you know, the reality is if you look at most police officers in the nation, there is a spot in the middle of our back that departments mo most of the time mandate nothing go to. And it's about, you're looking at about six inches one way or the other from the small, of the back. And the reason for that is, We've had a lot of officers fall and get hit right there. And they're out on medicals because a, a, a doctor has made a career of trying to rewire what you screw up back there uh, for the rest of their lives. So small the back carry, if it's the only option you absolutely have, then you, you have to do what you have to do. It's better to have a gun than no gun at all. Uh, but I don't, I don't ever promote it. I don't think it is a smart idea. You're going to have a thousand different guys that are going to tell you that it works for them. That's great. Uh, but you know, when people call in and they ask us, Hey, I need a holster for small, the back. Uh, I normally say, I don't recommend that. If you want to buy that and use that, that's fine. But we, you know, our official stance is we don't recommend that whole, uh, for small, the back carry. So, uh, the difference, uh, you know, in layman's terms, um, Appendix carry is very comfortable. And I think one of the benefits of appendix carry over hip carry is when you're out in a social setting, it is very socially unacceptable for people to tap you or put their hand obviously right there uh, above your belly button, below your belly button. But it is a little more acceptable for somebody to put a hand on your hip to help move you or to, you know, or for them not to run into you and things like that. Right. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 41 years old, but I still go to, uh, to metal concerts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I'm at a concert, I, I don't go in the mosh pit with it. Obviously we've, you know, all seen the news and yeah. realized that dancing with a weapon is not a smart <laughs> idea. But, uh, you know, when I go, I, I always wear appendix carry because even in a very crowded area like that, you know, people are not uh, going to bump up against me there. Right. So that's one of the benefits, I think. And, and, you know, when we're talking speed of draw and mechanics of draw, um, I'm t slightly, very slightly faster coming out of the appendix. Uh, so for me, it, it really is the only place I carry IWB. Um, you know, we make our holsters to sit very high on the belt for a reason to allow for mobility. So if you have a holster that you can't drive with because you're sitting there, then maybe you don't have the right holster. Yeah. So I don't, uh, I, I don't use anything other than appendix anymore. Uh, if I'm carrying inside the waistband now, if it's cold outs and, you know, um, and I have overgarments on or whatever, uh, I will wear an outside the waistband on my hip. Uh, but normally I don't even feel the need to do an inside on my hip for anything. Yeah. And so let, let's, uh, well, one thing you mentioned though, about, you know, people maybe not running into you kind of touching you, guiding you, if you, you know, when, uh, around, uh, around your abdomen, uh, that I think is a huge deal. And I also think too, people who are new to this, you know, that 
<laughs> they get into the idea of like, oh my God, I'm carrying a gun all the time. Mm-hmm. And, and there is a, a healthy level of awareness that you need to have, but you, there's also That's- a lot of touching. You know, I always notice like people are like, oh my God, could people see it? Could people notice it? And I think the nice thing about appendix carry is, I mean, you just look down, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Unless, unless the grip in the frame is hanging way out of your shirt, you would notice it, you know, instead of reaching behind your back or feeling your hip, or does it look like my hip is bulging or something like that? We get, you know, a a little uptight about that. And I, I think that's a, that's a good way to, to, kind of take care of that, if you will. And I notice on your holsters too, you know, cause I own one, I, I bought one personally and I have the oh, a- alpha clip version, uh, uh, for my Patriot and, you know, you guys put it right on there, like, you know, adjust, you know, clip height, uh, to what mm-hmm. you need it, tighten it, put the Loctite on all that kind of stuff. Once you get it, get it comfortable. So yeah, I think especially when it comes to something that is supposed to be a little more customizable to you, you know, folks that are buying these things need to realize that, you know, it's not necessarily out of the package and exactly how you want it. You know, you, you can make these, you know, uh, you know, the height adjustments and things to kind of fit your, fit your body profile and how you're carrying. Yeah. So the industry is kind of funny like that because like from a, a manufacturer's standpoint, um, some guys that are the, the guys that really take their training seriously, understand how to break their kit down, understand exactly what they want. When they order a holster, they want essentially a Lego set from us. Yeah. And we can kind of pick and play and put everything together and move it up and down. And that's great. But your average first time gun owner, like a lot of the people last month were in the month prior, they're going to look at a Lego set and go, well, what do I do with this thing? Right. So yeah. to try to find that balance where we give, you know, the the hardcore tactical guy exactly what he's looking for and he has the ability to do it, but also pretty much out of the box, you know, we have, have something that your average first time gun owner can look at and identify and go, oh, that goes right here. Okay, I'm good. Right. So, it, you know, finding that balance from a business owner standpoint, from a, you know, from a manufacturer standpoint is kind of tough some days. Yeah. Well, b- before we go on into individual product, I mean, let's talk quickly about, you know, OWB outside of the waistband uh, carrying. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people, you know, shy away from it just because, you know, maybe it's the type of clothes they wear or what they have to wear to work or, or whatever, which, you know, total, totally understandable. Um, but do, are there times where you recommend recommend OWB over IWB or is it more just based on the, you know, the lifestyle and what they're carrying and how they need to carry and so on? Yeah, the the OWB, you know, I, I think uh, the, the things that we see is I think geographically uh, we see it a little more prevalent down south because of the heat, uh, because a lot of guys, you know, if they're outside all day long and they're wearing an you know, appendix, um, it can get a little sweaty, mm-hmm. you know, uh, where the OWB kind of keeps it on your hip and it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't make you perspire as much and it doesn't get as uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, I, I think in, you know, in the colder areas where you're wearing a couple of different layers, I think the OWB is good. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand, like with ours, we actually design what we call a kick ramp into our OWBs. And when the, the biggest problem that we have with those is the butt of the gun sticks out the back and we actually can't, uh, we actually manufacture it. So the butt of that gun goes in about 20 degrees on the hip. So you, if you have a, a, a large enough shirt, you know, if you're a large and you wear an extra large, for example, you can conceal an outside with ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it really is preference. You know, there are days where I'm like, I don't mind it. Um, and I will run it uh, just because I run a, you know, a compact gun. So it doesn't, uh, you know, you can conceal a Glock 19 or, or a Patriot or something like that in an outside one of our outsides. So it really is preference. Um, I prefer as an instructor, I prefer teaching people off of an OWB on their hip because the mechanics of the draw are a lot simpler to understand because you don't have the garment manipulations where you have to lift the shirt up and bring it up. Right. So it it gives them less to think about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think OWB has a lot of benefits there as well. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about your guys's product in general. You know, what do you think is is the main thing that CNG brings to the market? I mean, you already talked a little bit about OWB and kind of canting that butt. Um, but what are some other things that that people can expect if they, you know, opt to purchase a holster from you? You know, one of the things that uh, I think the biggest thing that sets us apart in the industry is um, my experience. Uh, there are very few people, there are good holster designers, and then there are people that understand how to use a gun for a living. And there really are not anybody that can kind of bring both together. And that, that's the one thing that we do. You know, we do uh, custom handmade, you know, made holsters. We still do those for the people that want them. We have you know, we have a couple guys in the shop that that is their whole job all day is the custom hand make holsters. But when you start to CNC design things, and basically the half the size of a, the thickness of a piece of paper and accuracy, I can really start to dial in that holster to do exactly what I wanted to do and repeat that process 110% of the time. So it was some of the little things that we do. Um, the obviously that kick wing that we talked about with the inside stuff, the uh, with the outside, the insides and the outsides. A lot of the problem is uh, the guys do when they start Gucciing up their gun is they'll put they'll give it a grip job and they'll give it a, a a snipple job and they'll rough up the frame and everything else. Well, if you have a holster that was handmade, they it made it's completely molded to the contour of the gun. So when they pay that five hundred seven hundred dollars to get the gun. Uh, get the frame done, then the holster actually wears on that. And then they, uh, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. And one of the things that we do is we allow a little bit of an offset in all the areas that you would do that you would have when you have a grip job. So now the $500 grip job on top of the $500 gun isn't getting destroyed with a $60 holster. Mm -hmm. and, and so for us, it allows us to really get precise with the holster and make it do all the little things that as a shooter, I know I can do, but as an engineer, I knew how to bring together and design into the holster as well. So that to me, that's what really sets us apart. And the fact that uh, there's 13 of us in the back, in the shop and everybody, it, it, we're all like family. Um, yeah. You know, we always joke and we say that, you know, we need to bring a camera in here because the dysfunction is very entertaining. In most days. <laughs> For sure. And everybody is a hundred percent committed and they all have the same thing. Like what can we do to give the customer the best product possible? And uh, you know, I asked my shipping manager one day, I was like, I was like, shy, why do we do what we do? Why are we here? And I, and I was really curious because I wanted to see what she said. And she looked at me like very knee jerk. And she was like, we're here to make, make products for the good guys because she knows that I would say, you know, in the beginning, I would say about 80% of our business was law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, which a uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania, the, the cops here locally, uh, I, I, I could not thank them enough because we are where we are because of them, but even nationwide and even worldwide, uh, I would still say our business is still 40 to 50% law enforcement. Wow. And the guys know that. So when we manufacture everything, we manufacture it like it's going to a law enforcement officer or to, you know, or to a, a military base and it has to be done a hundred percent right? Or it doesn't go out the door. And when she looked at me like a knee jerk reaction, it was like, we make stuff for the good guys. It, it, to me, that proved to me where we are in the, in, in the industry, where our set, our standards and what we design and what we can, our quality is. Yeah, for sure. Well, there is one piece and, and I'll show some uh, photos of it on, on the podcast. But, you know, like I said, I use one of uh, your holsters with the alpha clips. And I, I think you you were probably the only the first one that I've, I've seen that had a, a system quite like it. I, um, you know, rather than just the regular paddle uh, mm -hmm. that people are used to. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you this, like when I put it on, like there is zero feeling that it is going to come out with the gun. <laughs> there is, it is on there. Um, so, uh, you know, how did, uh, get, cause I want, that is, I think that is a, a unique thing to your product. How did that come about? And, uh, you know, what, what were some of the design aspects and maybe engineering aspects that went into that? 
Well, so we work with uh, Jamie Caldwell over one minute out. Uh, Jamie is uh, personally one of just honestly one of the best people I've ever met. Uh, don't tell him that because it goes right to his head. <laughs> yeah, but we can edit that out. Just, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. He, but he is a great guy just personally. Uh, the fact that I respect him so much, uh, it makes me want to make a better product with him, if that makes sense. It's mm -hmm. a motivation for me. Uh, but we we make a, uh, a sidecar system. It's called the Mod 1. And it's basically a modular system and allows them to, to change out. The, if they want to put an extra mag next to the gun, they can put in a handcuff case for cops. Uh, we're working on a tourniquet holder right now and we have flashlight holders uh we actually are working with geisley uh with their knives so that they can have a gun and a knife and uh some of the people really loved it but some of the other people were like man it's a little too big for for us and depending on your body type it is what it is right so we decided we were going to start offering the alpha package where we take those same clips uh that we get from matt over at discrete carry concept concepts and we started to put them together and the, and the cool part about it was, you know, everything that we designed with those alphas was all intention built. It wasn't me trying to slap this on. Cause a lot of times you see some of the people in the industry where they just throw a stick on it and they throw this and they slap yeah. this on and we'll just mount that to here. The, everything, you know, people don't understand that even the, the, the outsides are wings are actually made to go on a body that has a 36 inch waist at the hip because everybody's waist has a different circumference and different angles to it. So when we made the alpha, we designed the alpha to sit on the body at the appendix point. And how do we have that pin? on there and sit there the right way without it sliding back and forth what angles do we need to have those different clips at how do we need to put our our dark wing at how do we how do we make this the most effective product that we can you know and one of the other things that we did with that alpha is a lot of guys they run a wing system we have our own mm -hmm. uh, between us and tom over at dark star him and i sat down together and we designed uh the dark wing and we have a light wing coming out too for our tactical light bearing holsters uh it'll be out actually next week so you're the first guys to know about it <laughs> great great yeah uh but you know, even with the way that we have the dark wing uh, positioned on the body and positioned on the holster and how it all brings it together, what you do is you take an inside. If you're looking at the belt line, looking down, you take a gun and then you put a wing on it and you can it. Well, now you only have this part touching the body and it's digging into the body. Yes, it's concealing it, but it's really not that comfortable. So what we did was we figured out through the geometry and the design, the angle of how it sits on the body. And then we created a little bit of a comfort channel to sit so that the, it sits flat, the gun sits at the angle, and it still doesn't add any more uh, bulk to it to make it less concealable. So essentially the, the comfort channel that we put on the back and it has a channel in the middle of it, the, the wick, the sweat away. It, 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 it it's really, um, my marketing guy really gets on me about it, but we're really proud of it. And I guess we don't really, um, boast about it as much as uh, he would like. Us sure. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I could say it, it's worked great for me. And again, that's, you know, carrying uh, one of our FX 19 Patriots. And uh, uh, again, you, you never feel that it's, you know, wiggling around or going to pop out or, or do anything like that. And, uh, you know, and, it, and especially for folks who maybe, you know, are used to only carrying something super small, you know, mm -hmm. like a 380 or something, you know, what, you know, getting into something that even though it's still subcompact, you, you know, it's still quite a bit larger than, you know, some of the slim nines and, and three eighties and things that are out there, you know, making sure that you have a holster that you feel it, comfortable one using and two that it is concealing the way that you hope it's concealing. You know, that's, that's a huge deal. Chris, yeah. where could people find more information about you guys uh, and uh, just learn more about what CNG is doing? You can, you can follow us. Uh, everything on Instagram is at cngarms.com. That's the parent company that owns CNG. Uh, we have a training side and we have a holster side and we have some other things. So we just put it all under one umbrella. Uh, you can go on our YouTube channel, which is CNG Holsters, or you can go on our website, which is www.cngholsters.com. I'll spell it out. So that's Charlie Alpha, November Delta, Golf Alpha, or Golf 
holsters.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. I would have been here a while. Uh, if I yeah. tried to call it. <laughs> uh, well, and also just so you know, we are working uh, with Christopher and the team at CNG to bring uh, CNG holsters to our website as well. So soon you'll be able to visit factsandfirearms.com and under the handgun accessories tab, you'll be able to find some holsters there as well. And we're super excited about getting that underway. Christopher, thank you so much for taking some time for us. We really appreciate it. Sure, Dustin, thank you for having me. It was a great time, and uh, anything you need, please let me know. Will do. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about Christopher and CNG, not only the holsters, but also what they do on the firearms training side, make sure that you visit the blog article for this week's episode. You can find that at factsandfirearms.com slash blog, and all the links to their social media channels and website will be there as well. Don't forget that if you are interested in winning one of the Old Glory prize packs featuring a couple of custom Bantam PCCs, we're giving away two prize packs, so double the opportunity to win make sure you visit factsandfirearms.com and check out this awesome promotion that we have lined up with sb tactical wheeler crimson trace ets and one-off coatings uh, as well as condition one cases it's going to last for a few more days depending on when you're watching this but uh, nonetheless it's a fun promotion you should definitely check it out again thanks for joining and we'll see you next week we want to extend our deepest gratitude to military, police, first responders, and more by saying thank you with special pricing and discounts on all facts and products. Here's how you get started. First, you'll head on over to our website, factsandfirearms.com. From there, you'll want to click Support and Guardian Purchase Program in the drop-down. Then you'll see the instructions on how to get started, so let's just walk through those. First, you'll want to register for an account on our website. If you've already bought something from us on our website before, then this part's already taken care of. Second, you'll want to send a copy of your credentials or some reasonable verification of affiliation to customer service at factsandfirearms.com. We get a lot of emails where people are like, hey, will this count? Will this ID count? Will this VA card count? Chances are, yes, a lot of them will count, but make sure you attach an image or a copy of that verification to the email before you even ask customer service. That way they can expedite the process for you. As soon as the account has been created or updated, we will send you an email letting you know that you're ready to go. The discount will be available anytime online when you go to your shopping cart. If you have any more questions, please email customer service at factsandfirearms.com.